Welcome to day two of our thrilling journey through Israel. Join me as we delve into the captivating history and biblical significance of Caesarea, Mount Carmel, Tale of Megiddo, and Nazareth, each in their own video. Prepare for an awe-inspiring adventure through these remarkable destinations. Our first stop is Caesarea Maritima, a city with rich history and deep biblical connections. This magnificent city was built by Herod the Great and was named in honor of the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. Caesarea underwent significant transformations under Herod's rule, boasting a deep sea harbor, storerooms, markets, temples, and imposing public buildings. Caesarea, along with all of Judea, was awarded by Rome to Herod the Great in 30 BC. In 22 BC, Herod began construction of a deep sea harbor named Sebastos. Herod built his palace on a promontory jutting out into the sea with a decorative pool surrounded by stoas. Every five years, the city hosted major sports competitions, gladiator games, and theatrical productions in its theater overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. Caesarea Maritima's history extends beyond the Roman era. In the 12th century, it became a strategic stronghold for the Crusaders. They constructed a fortified city atop the Roman ruins, leaving their mark on the landscape. The Crusader city is a captivating blend of Roman and medieval architecture, offering a glimpse into the medieval period. Outside of the Grand Theater, we see statues, including a stone statue depicting Jesus as the Good Shepherd. This portrayal of Jesus reflects the adaptation of a motif that originated in ancient Greek sculpture and continued into Hellenistic and Roman arts. One of the remarkable structures still partially standing in Caesarea is its Grand Theater, built in a half circle outside the city walls. Because its obscene and bawdy performances may have created an offense among religious Jews. Below the stairs are rooms where they could change. It hosted various performances, sports competitions, and gladiator games. The floor of the orchestra, the semicircle space in front of the stage where the important people sat in Roman times, was colorfully painted stone in Herod's time and later paved with marble. The front of the stage, or the orchestra wall, was painted stone imitating marble. There are six wedges of seats. The square place for the governor's seat can be seen midway in the center wedge. However, its allure and entertainment reviewed, were viewed with resistance by the religious community, symbolizing a clash of values between Caesarea and Jerusalem. An ancient rabbi named Yezek is quoted as saying that Caesarea and Jerusalem could not prosper at the same time. Either one or the other would be in ruins. This was his way of teaching that the values represented by Caesarea and its theater were opposed to those of Jerusalem and the temple. Caesarea was a fancy city in its day. This gives us an idea of how the life looked like at the time of Jesus. For us, as Christians, it's important. If we go back to the book of Genesis, Abraham first believed and he was called righteous, and the Gentiles who lived here and who believed in God were also righteous. Galatians 3, 6-9 says, So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith 
are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. These people believed in God and were righteous. The Roman centurion Cornelius, who lived here in Caesarea, was one of those people. Yesterday's video, we saw that Peter had a vision while he was in Jaffa, and then he was told to come to Caesarea to baptize Cornelius. Cornelius was the first Gentile convert to Christian Christianity. Before that time, only Jews were allowed to be baptized. The Bible also records the death of Herod Agrippa I, which Josephus recorded taking place in the theater in Acts 12, verses 19-23. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace, because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. So he did not give the glory. He accepted the, the people's adoration and did not correct them when they called him a god. You can see here where he would have been sitting. This was his, um, his throne seat in the theater. As we make our way towards the coast, we encounter an awe-inspiring Herodian harbor. This harbor was a monumental engineering feat of its time. It facilitated the trades of good, connecting Caesarea to the rest of the Roman Empire and beyond. The harbor's ruins stand as a reminder of the city's significance as a bustling economic hub. It was originally a small Phoenician town, known as Stratton's Tower, and it was developed by Herod the Great into a major port city. Herod oversaw the construction of the massive artificial harbor, one of the largest in the world at the time, called Sebastos. Both the city of Caesarea and the harbor of Sebastos were named after Herod's patron, Augustus Caesar, Sebastos being the Greek equivalent of Augustus. One of the most remarkable structures within the city is the Promontory Palace. This opulent palace once served as residence of the Crusader rulers and boasted luxurious features such as a central courtyard, ornate halls, and stunning views of the sea. This stone was an important discovery because it proves that Pontius Pilate was a real person. In this picture, this is the swimming pool of Herod the Great's palace. The white arrow on the left screen is pointing to the swimming pool. It was built into the sea. And the two circles, black circles, at the bottom of the picture shows where they had mosaic tiles. And those are still seen today. These are Roman wells, or cisterns, where they would collect water. And when they were empty, they would use them as gel cells. The Hippodrome is an arena for chariot races and other games uncovered in the archaeological excavations conducted at Caesarea in the years 1982 to 88. It is identified with the amphitheater mentioned by Josephus Flavius. Herod also built a theater of stone in the city. And on the south side of the harbor, further back, an amphitheater large enough to hold a great crowd of people and conveniently situated for a view of the sea. The location on the seashore and the architecture of the structure exposed 
fit this description. The structure, U-shaped, was built on a north-south axis parallel to the coastline. The local stone served as the exclusive building material. The arena was about 358 yards long and 54 yards wide. The seats holding 12 rows with a seating capacity for 10,000 spectators enclosed it on the east, south, and west. They were arranged in 18 segments, 12 of which are still preserved. The starting gates enclosed the area on the north. In the Bible, Caesarea is mentioned on multiple occasions. Aside from the discussion about the death of Herod Agrippa and the conversion of Cornelius the centurion, other notable references to the city include the first biblical figure associated with Caesarea was Philip the Evangelist, who shared the gospel in Caesarea after a great persecution expelled many believers from Jerusalem. Acts 8, verse 1 and 40. Eventually, Philip settled down in Caesarea, living there with his family and hosting other believers at his home. Acts 21, verse 8. Paul the Apostle, another famous evangelist, traveled through Caesarea several times. Early in his ministry, when his life was threatened in Jerusalem, the believers there helped him escape through Caesarea to Tarsus, undoubtedly aboard a Caesarean ship. After his second missionary journey, Paul passed through Caesarea on his way to Syrian Antioch. Using his time in Caesarea as an opportunity to visit Jerusalem, about 52 miles away, Acts 18.22. On his famous and final recorded trip to Jerusalem, near the end of the book of Acts, Paul stayed in Caesarea with Philip the Evangelist for several days, meeting with Agabus the prophet and enjoying fellowship with local believers, Acts 21, verses 8-16. to The disciples in Caesarea begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but eventually traveled with him when they realized he could not be dissuaded. Acts 21, 12-16 Later, Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea for years, facing several trials there before various Roman officials with whom he was able to share the gospel numerous times. Acts 23-26 Caesarea continued to have a storied history into the Christian era, hosting major figures in the early church and preserving Christian literature in its libraries. It became a flourishing, multi-ethnic community and an important center for education, writing, and intellectual discourse. Eventually, Caesarea suffered attrition during the Middle Ages through conflict between Christian and Muslim forces, and it was ultimately destroyed in the 13th century by a Mamluk army. As a monument to man's achievements, both Caesarea and the Roman Empire that sponsored it are long gone. However, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which impacted this famed city, lives on around the world and continues to change lives today. Thank you for watching this video and joining me on this incredible journey to explore and learn about these significant biblical sites. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more, please consider subscribing to my channel. By subscribing, you'll never miss an episode and will be a part of of our growing community of believers. Additionally, I want to invite you to support this channel and my mission further by becoming a patron on my Patreon platform. Your generous support will enable me to continue creating insightful content, interviewing missionaries, and shining a spotlight on the vital work they do around the world. Together, we can make a difference and support these impactful missions. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to sharing more incredible stories and insights with you 
in future videos. Stay connected, subscribe, and join me on this inspiring journey. God bless you.